I want to talk to you today on the subject of living out of your heart. Every single one of us would love to see the month or the year of 2012 have more joy. How many of you say, I just wish life could be easier and I had more joy? You realize that if you had more joy, life flows smooth. Yeah, everything's easier when you're happy. Well, y'all here today? Y'all here, right? Okay. Well, in Ezekiel, we're going to read a prophetic passage. Parts of Ezekiel, a little hard to understand, but here Ezekiel is prophesying of the New Testament, the new covenant with God. And in Ezekiel 36, verse 25, the Lord says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from your filthiness and from all your idols. How many of you say that actually happened to me? The Lord washed away my sins and took idolatry out of my life. Verse 26, Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Verse 26 explains why in the New Testament we can serve God with a glad heart and the anointing of God. And it says because I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. In the Old Testament, they served God with external obedience from a heart that was hard and rebellious. They couldn't change their hearts. Until Jesus Christ died on the cross and was resurrected, nobody could be born again. But today, we have been born of his very presence and essence. We have been born of his spirit. Yeah. In our spirit, we are very much like God. If you have accepted Jesus as your Savior. So in verse 25, it says, when we get born again, we get cleansed. In verse 26, we get a new heart or spirit. I want you to notice that the Bible uses the word heart and spirit almost interchangeably, and we will use them interchangeably today. Because when you live out of your heart, you live from a place that thinks like God, and loves like God, and considers life like God. Amen. And then in verse 27, he said, I'll put my spirit within you. What does that mean? It means that in the New Testament, we have a heart to obey that they did not in the Old Testament because, number one, we've been born again and have a tender heart. And number two, he, by his Holy Spirit, lives within us. Amen. It's really important that you realize that is not theoretical. No. That is not a religious term. No. Everybody say, he lives in me. He lives in me. Hebrews 8.6 says that this, the New Testament is a better covenant with better promises. Look at this, it says, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is, this is Jesus, he, Jesus is a mediator of a better covenant with better promises. We can live on a level that they never even dreamed of in the Old Testament because we can walk with God. They had the presence of God and the Ark of the Covenant behind all these thick veils in the Holy of Holies and that veil ripped and now our heart is his Holy of Holies. Everybody say, thank God. Let's go to 1 Peter 1.22. first part might be a little elementary for some of us, but it's so, under, it's so important to understand what happened to you in the new birth. Yep. Because when we get defeated, it's because we've started living in our minds and not in our hearts. Mm -hmm. Just hold that thought. If you understand it, we'll get there. 1 Peter 1.22. Peter writes, Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls from a, for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another, from the heart. Now, why should we love each other from the heart? Because that's where God lives. And Romans 5 says that his love has been poured out within our hearts. We live from the heart. We don't go around judging people. Okay? And then verse 23. For you have been born again. Not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and abiding word of God. The first time you were born, you were born from a physical seed, a sperm, physically, and you have a body. But the second time you were born, you were born of the living word of God. Just as God spoke to Mary and that word became flesh in her, amen? The, when we receive the truth of God's word, our spirits are reborn in the image and likeness of God. Let's go to Ephesians 4.24. The first part of this is very much teaching, but I think we're going to apply it in an exciting way. Ephesians 4.24. <coughs> Paul writes, 
Paul is writing, and he exhorts the church in Ephesus, put on the new self, or most translations say the new man, who in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Now the important part of this verse is that you don't create a new person. It says you put that new person on. Yeah. It says put on the new man who in the likeness of God. You, the real you inside, your spirit, yeah. has been created to look very much like Jesus yeah. Christ. With the same love and wisdom and, and sensitivity to the Holy Spirit that Jesus had. And he doesn't say try to be that person. He said just put him on. Yeah. But what does that mean? It means he's hidden in your heart. But you've got to get that new man out to where he affects your mind. And your body. Right. Your reborn human spirit is a powerhouse in the spiritual realm if you come to know it. Your spirit has been created to look like Jesus, respond in love like Jesus, hear the wisdom of the Father like he did, and minister the kindness of the Father's heart like he did. Yeah. Most of all, your reborn human spirit is so ready to believe God. Amen. When you're in the spirit, believing God is the easiest thing in the world. Yeah. Okay? First John 4, 17 just one a little more radical here. Let's just read this one on, on the screen. It says, By this love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Look at the last phrase. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. Amen. Christians are supposed to be turning the world upside down. Yeah. We're supposed to have the same radical effect as Jesus did and as the early church did. And you say, well, if that's so, Pastor, why in the world aren't there more Christians turning, you know, the northern neck upside down. Okay, this is, I believe there's two reasons. Number one, most of us have never been taught who we are in Christ or what happened to us when we asked Jesus into our hearts, number one. And number two, most of us live out of our minds and not out of our reborn human spirits. And you say, is this condemnation? No, I mean, this is a battle. After 30 years of being filled with the Spirit and walking with God, I still get into my mind thinking, come on, thinking, and I get worried, 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 and then I get full of doubt, and I feel like I can't, I get into confusion. Now, none of you do. Y'all look so innocent. You can help me and pray for me afterwards. But you know what? When we get down here, like a Sunday night a lot of times, we'll begin to hear the word, and then we'll just worship for a while. And in the Lord's presence, there comes a clarity yeah. to where you see a problem, and you see, well, that's obvious what I should do about that and how I should deal with that situation. You hear from God as if he's standing there talking to you. Yeah. You know what? Because you are in the Spirit yeah. uh -huh. instead of in your head. Yeah. Now, you say, well, I don't understand the difference. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5.23. I love studying this, even though I learned about it a lot of years ago, because you can know these things and let them slip. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5.23. You realize the Bible is written extremely accurately. Yeah. Okay, the Holy Spirit wrote through the men who wrote the Bible. And Paul, the Holy Spirit through Paul here in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. His prayer is, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now in this, this verse, he clearly lists the three parts that you're made of. Yeah. Spirit, soul, and body. Now the first thing I want to ask is which did he list first? Spirit. If you watch for an ad for a spa, Many times an ad will say, take care of your body, mind, and spirit. Sometimes they get all three parts in there, but they always listen backwards. Watch. I heard Dad Hagen say this years and years ago. He said, listen to preachers, and they'll say, body, mind, and spirit. It isn't, but, yeah, okay, you got the three parts, but you got them out of order. Yeah. That's why we're worried this week. We got them out of order. Uh -huh. Spirit, everybody say spirit, spirit. Soul, soul, and body. body. Now, years ago, I heard Brother Hagin say that I, he began to listen to preachers, and he realized a lot of preachers use the words spirit and soul interchangeably. They are not interchangeable. Mm -hmm. Your soul consists of your mind, your will, and your emotions. And what he did is he began to say, well, God, I've got to understand what is the soul realm. And he did it by process of elimination. The Lord showed him this. 
He said, well, if I'm going to relate to this pulpit, what do I use? I. Right. I'm going to relate to God. He's a spirit. I use my spirit. And he said, well, what other realm is there? There's the intellectual, emotional realm. Yeah. If I go home and I see a scientific article of a good study, I like to read studies, because if they're well done, you can learn from the truth is truth. If I read a scientific study, I am relating to that on a soul realm, an intellectual realm. Yep. You can come into some surfaces or some places where people think they're all excited about God, and all of this is on the emotional realm, the selfish realm. That's not bad, but that's not spirit to spirit. Do you get spirit to spirit with God? You've got to close down this little chatterbox of a head and love them heart to heart. Okay. This. Okay. I'm not get there. You're thinking here. I'm not saying we don't use our minds. Like, if I come to the stop sign out here, I do not pray about whether a car is coming. I don't say, okay, God, is there a car coming? <laughs> no. I let my mind get information from the physical realm, the truth. That, yeah, there's a big truck going, I'm going to pull out. Right. But there are certain things that you, your mind will never get information about, and you need to know. And at that point, you need to know how to relate to your spirit yes. and how to contact right. your spirit. Yes. All right, so the body is the house that you live in. And... Um, Let's go to 2 Corinthians 5, 1. I just want to back off for a second and say there's a reason that um, we're not as aware of our spirits. I, I heard a message Creflo Dollar was preaching to his congregation. And, you know, he has a very well-taught congregation. That man is a teacher. And he said, are spiritual things as real as physical things? And they paused. Come on. There was a hesitation. And I noticed it. I didn't think he'd say, he said, y'all waited. Y'all, it's like, honey, spiritual things are way more real than physical things. God, who is a spirit, said, light be. And everything that we see became. This, the spiritual realm is not subject to the physical. That's right. The physical is subject to the spiritual realm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a great man of God named Smith Rose, and you said, why isn't it real to me? I'll tell you exactly why. Because we pamper the flesh, we feed the flesh, we're aware of the flesh, we're worried if we have a bad hair day, we're happy if we have a good hair, you know, we're aware of this realm. There was a great man of God named Smith Wigglesworth who saw many miracles in his ministry. And he had a habit that sounds radical, but it changed his life. He refused to feed his flesh without feeding his spirit. And you say, well, how do you feed his spirit? Well, remember, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Yeah. Your spirit is chowing down as I'm talking to you right now if I'm feeding you the word of God. That's right. If I'm just telling you stories, your spirit's oh. not, not eating. You know, you can go to a service uh -huh. if it's just a good That's political right. discussion. And you, you leave feeling cheated. You feel hungry. Yeah. Like all they said was lemon meringue and you never have got the steak, right? Mm -hmm. Now... Listen, I can do that too if I don't get to work. Right now, your spirit is seeing truth as we look at scripture and you are eating and you're real living. You see, you're born again, a little tiny baby. Peter said, long for the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Yeah. When you're feeding your spirit, I know a few times I have gone to conventions, like the Copeland's conventions, where for four days, from more early in the morning until late at night, they just feed the truth of the word of God. And you are so strong when you come out of there that the devil could try to get you to sit and just laugh yeah. or try to get you into God because your spirit has, fed, has been fed well. Yeah. Yeah. Smith Wigglesworth did this, and, and some people that traveled with him verified it. He said, they said, we'd sit down, we'd eat a good meal, and then when we were all just sitting, goofing around, he'd say, excuse me, and he cleared his throat, he pulled his New Testament out of the pocket, he said, we just fed the outer man, now let's feed the inner man. He never ate a meal without reading eight to ten verses of scripture and just commenting on it briefly. Mm -hmm. I'll say, that's yeah. radical. Hey, we live in a radical age. Yeah. We live facing an enemy that knows his time is short. Yeah. Right. Is that what the Bible says? Yeah, yeah Jesus is coming. Yeah. This is the end of the age. Satan knows that his time is short and he's riled up. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, like, it doesn't take a, a lightning fast mind to know that. I, if, if some of you could have been around in the 1950s and 60s, I mean, at least the 50s, we, this, this was a very sane nation. Mm. I never heard of a knife going to school, let alone gut. It was so peaceful. And now it's just like every day is something new. I don't even want to hear about it. Why? We are in intense spiritual warfare. And it's that scary. It's not scary if you stay in the spirit. The Bible says the mindset upon the flesh is death. 
because in this realm the devil with you. But the mind set upon the spirit is life yeah. and peace. Now let's read the scripture in 2 Corinthians 5, which is talking about our bodies. Verse 1, Paul says, For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And what does that mean, if our house is torn down? This, this body is the house I live in. Yeah. You might see my van going down the road and say, oh, there goes Pastor. And really, you didn't see me. You just saw my van and you want to drive. But, well, that's the way it is with the body. You say, oh, I see you. No, you really just see the house I live in. I have the spirit, so are you. Yeah. But Paul says the good news is that if this house is torn down, I mean, we have to do the funeral for someone on Tuesday who was 16 years old. He died before his time, but thank God he got born again and saved on a trip with one of our kids. It's Lisa's nephew. And you know, his house was torn down in an automobile wreck, and I wish it hadn't been. But you know what? The good news is that he had another house waiting for him. Oh, yeah. This is where we know that the earth, the temple, which is our house, is torn down, and we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, made by God, eternal in the heavens. And then the next verse says, for indeed in this house we grow and long to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. So the point is that the body is what we live in, the spirit is the real you, and your mind is this wonderful computer that you think with. Thank God. And your emotions you emote with. Now, the important part to remember is that if you go home and you sit down in front of your computer this afternoon and your computer says, you want to check your email? I love you. That computer's lying. Come on. That computer just lied to you. That computer doesn't love you. You know why? There's nothing in there to love with. No. Nope. All right? Your mind is really a wonderful computer, but if you live out of it, you won't live on the level of love you were meant to. Right. Okay, let's go to second. If we're right here in Second Corinthians 5, let's look at verse 17. Just to see what happens to us. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away, and behold, new things have come. Now, we know we weren't talking about that earthly tent mentioned in verse 1. Because if you had gray hair when you accepted Jesus, unless you got Larry, Lady Claire all real fast, you still got really gray hair. <laughs> all right? So we're not talking about the earth. What part? The spirit of you is totally and completely reborn. As we read in Ezekiel, he said, I'll take out that heart of stone and put it within you a heart of flesh, a new spirit. All things become new in the real you. Sin yeah. is gone, then replaced with the tender love of God. Yeah. Your body may start feeling better after a while because you've been born again. Because you learn about the healing power of God, you have the vigor of God, but the truth is your body isn't made new, it's your spirit. And it doesn't mean that your mind and thinking are automatically renewed. Yeah. Because your mind is just simply, you know what's in your computer right now? It's whatever you have set in there. That's right. All right? If you want to change what's in your computer, you have to download a new set of information. Hallelujah. And that's the way your mind is. Your spirit loves God, but your mind may have a lot of questions even about this sermon right now if you're brand new in the Lord. Come because on. renewing of the mind is a process. Let's go to Romans 12. Yeah. We're almost past the teaching. I'm going to look up those stories. Romans 12 talks about getting a brand new download in your head, and that takes time. It isn't like the instantaneous new birth. Romans 12 says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is a reasonable service of worship. So your bodies, you just you give to God as they are. And then it talks about your mind, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. A lot of translations, or some translations, say don't be, where it, where it says don't be conformed, it says don't let this world squeeze you into its mold. This world has a theology that just contradicts the word of God. And they talk Jesus, and they'll make you think sometimes. But you know, there's a whole lot of things that this world says is so, but it's just not so. And you say, well, how do I walk in the power of God? You have to read the word of God and find out what he says about it. Oh, it's quiet in here. Come on. Can I give you one of my pet peeves that is just not so? 
If you're going through a very hard time like losing a loved one, you know the presence of God because people are praying for you and he's with you. But when people say, I feel my loved one, no, your loved one's in heaven. And you see, that's not very popular for me to say that because oh. everybody says, oh, he's right here looking over me. No, he's part of the great cloud of witnesses in heaven. It says, can I tell you the truth? Of what, is that what the word says? Amen. You see, if we, get, we Christians, we get so intimidated by this new age philosophy that we are afraid to even say what the Bible says. Now, I know that my husband who passed away on April 15, 2001, is part of the great cloud of witnesses. Would you pull up, pull up Hebrews 12? They need to see this. Yeah. Because a lot of times in a difficult situation, when they say, I can feel his presence, talking about a loved one departed, I hate to say anything because I know how bad it hurts to grieve. Yeah. And I just don't feel like correcting their theology at that moment. Because they're in pain. They don't need any more pain. They don't need a preacher setting them straight at that moment. But at some point, we need to understand where our loved ones are. We do not communicate with the dead. Deuteronomy 20, or chapter 18, all right? You don't talk to them, and they don't talk to you. If we are forbidden to try to talk to the dead through seances or things like that, that's in the Bible. I'll show it to you if you don't know the scripture. But now look where it says our loved ones are if they've gone to be with the Lord. The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us. If you read the chapter before, it's chapter 11 of Hebrews. It's the great hall of fame of faith. Daniel and David and Moses and Abraham. Amen? All these great... Yeah. And Pastor Gordon. Amen. And your loved ones that they knew Jesus. My grandma that prayed me out of hell and into heaven is part of that great line of witnesses. Therefore, since we have so great a kind of witnesses surrounding us, let us... Yeah, okay, they're surrounding us. They're in heaven. They, they're they observing and cheering. But here... I don't know why I brought that up. I just think it needs to be corrected. Yeah. Pastor Gordon doesn't walk with me. He's in heaven. If somebody says, well, I feel mama's presence. Well, your mama's prayers are still here with you, but your mama's in heaven. Amen. Okay, you can get mad at me for telling you that. That's what the Bible says. Let's give glory to the one with whom glory is due. It is his wonderful Holy Spirit who walks with us. A person. All right, we better get her. I want to show you something. The whole point of today's message is, are you open to the truth? It was truth that invaded your life and got you born again. And you had two choices. You could have closed your heart and gone straight to hell, and some people have done it, unfortunately. Or you can be tender and open and say, oh, thank God, I do not want to pay for my sins a second time. Amen? It, the, you say, how do you learn to walk in the Spirit? You stay open to truth. All right, let me finish what I want to tell you about Romans 12, where we're talking about presenting your bodies. We are transformed by the brain. We need to go back there. I'm sorry, because I want to show you that Romans 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why in the world would you want to be transformed? Watch. So that you may prove, so that you may walk out the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. One thing I know that is that, okay, back off. Boy, we didn't like the part about relatives, huh? I'm sorry, but your dead relatives are not with you. It's a good thing to know. You love them. But you don't, you know, okay. Just go home and search it out. Don't take my word for it. Okay. Now listen, Batch, are we all on the same page that we love the word of God? Yeah. This just told you why you should be transformed. If I ask you as a congregation, have my head and had everybody put their wall up about that other thing. Listen, how many of you really, really want to fulfill your destiny. How many of you know that you were put on this earth for a reason? Amen. And when you get to the end of your life and you stand before God, more than anything in this world, you want to hear him say, you did everything I created you to do. Well done, you good. Yeah, okay? okay? This verse tells you how you get started to fulfilling your destiny. Do you realize you won't wake up tomorrow morning, destiny? No. <laughs> destiny is a walk. You walk into your destiny by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you say, how do you do that? Well, you don't be conformed to the world. Amen. You say, I'm not going to go by what the world thinks, but what the Bible says. Yeah. I'm going to be transformed by the renewing of my mind so that I may prove what the will of God is. We're going to get that. we got to get this. Yeah. You say, I don't want my mind renewed. Then forget about your destiny. Right. Come on. I'm just going to sit down and let everybody think about it. This 
Read it with me and see if I'm exaggerating, please. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove or demonstrate yeah. what the will of God is. The only way you demonstrate the will of God is, is to live it out where people watch you and say, you're in the will of God. Yeah. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may demonstrate the will of God, which will, the good, acceptable, and the absolute perfect will of God for your life. And you get there by renewing your mind and living in the spirit. Okay, to fulfill your God-given purpose in life, you have to live in the light of eternity. The one thing I've noticed in doing funerals and being aware of heaven, when people are aware of heaven, they make better decisions. I'll tell you the truth. The day in 1990 when my husband was first told he had cancer, I had a list of priorities walking into that doctor's office, and I had a different list of priorities walking out. Come on. I'm not trying to be melodramatic. As I recall, we had had, we didn't fight about money, but we had had a you know, disagreement about money the day before. You know, just a discussion, you know, and a couple of discussions about money. I just want you to know, on the way out, it didn't matter. I didn't care if we had a lot of money in the bank or no money in the bank. It didn't oh, matter. My husband's life was at risk. Thank God he lived another 11 years. We had another child. And God was good. But my point is that in the face of life and death, yep. all priorities change. Yeah. People who live aware of heaven make much better decisions than those who don't. And you say, well, do you have any evidence? First of all, Jesus taught constantly of heaven and of heaven. <laughs> I, yeah. I looked in, in the concordance. Just in the New American Standard Bible, just the word heaven is used 450 times in the Bible. 450. And the word heavens, plural, is used another 100 times. In the, if you read the Bible a lot, you're going to be very aware of eternity. Yeah. If you're interested in fulfilling your destiny, you have to be willing to live all of life in the light of eternity. Go to Acts chapter 9 and we'll see what happened to Saul of Tarsus. Just to finish my point about when we lose someone that we love, you know that when usually if you do a funeral, the family just draws together. Hallelujah. You know why? Because they love each other. Amen. All the stupid stuff they were fighting. It, are you seeing what I'm saying? Yeah. If you live in the light of eternity, you don't sweat the small stuff. 90% of the stuff you're upset about this week won't matter in a year. Yep. Almost none of it will matter in 10 years. Yeah. I remember right, right after my husband home to be with the Lord, somebody in the church, they're no longer here, so don't worry about who it is, but they had a big party, it was outdoors, and it was going to rain. And they were utterly devastated for a week that rained on the child's party. And they couldn't get me to cry with them. Well, I tried to cry with them. But when you've lost the best friend you've ever had in all of life, rain on a party isn't a real big deal. I'm sorry. Yeah. Are you understanding? Yeah. And when you get things in paternal perspective, you'll start making really good decisions. Yeah. Now, in Saul of Tarsus, let's start at verse 3. If you remember, he was headed for Damascus, very sure of himself, convinced that killing Christians was the greatest service he could render God, right? Yeah. Verse 3. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up, enter the city, and it will be told to you what you must do. Now, here's a question. Was Saul 100% positive he was on a divine mission to kill Christians? Uh, yes. Was his head wrong? Yep. His head was wrong. Is it possible to be sincere and sincerely wrong? <laughs> yeah. I mean, this society will tell you, hey, if you believe with all your heart, that's your truth. No, truth is objective. Truth is true. Yeah. All right? Exactly. Now listen, what interrupted his logic and reasoning? Look at verse 3. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly... Everybody say a light from heaven. A light from heaven flashed around him. And in that moment, everything looked different. He said, I've got to kill those Christians. And then Jesus himself said, excuse me, I'm Jesus. And he said, whoops, killed the wrong ones. Uh oh. And later in the chapter, you'll find out he's preaching Jesus instead of killing the people following him. Yeah. 
What changed a man from being a murderer of Christians to be a preacher that converts Christians? Come on. Everybody say a light from heaven. Amen. What happened to you that you were getting drunk, living for the devil, and all of a sudden one day you gave your heart to Jesus? Come on. Everybody say, well, listen, say it, a light from heaven. Did you know that when you got saved, it was that revelation from heaven that interrupted your natural human reasoning and brought you truth from another realm? Yes, Okay. So Saul had his theology abandoned, but we think, okay, we think, I have friends that are unsaved. If only I could get them to see the truth, right? Mm -hmm. God spends all of our lives trying to help us to see our truth. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to spend this week trying to help me to see how to walk in love. Better. That's true. More truth. Watch, if you don't think so, watch verse 8. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, and he could see nothing, and leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for a man named, from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he may regain his sight. But Ananias said, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. Now, let's just pause for a minute and ask some questions. Was Ananias a follower of Christ? From what realm did he get the instructions, go to a street named Straight? From the spiritual, mental, or physical realm? In the spiritual realm. What is it, did his head say in verse 14? Come on. In 13. He says, I've heard about this guy. What about my wife and kids? If I go try to help this guy, he's going to kill me. He kills Christians. Now, question Did his heart or did his head win out? Thank God. How, how many of you love the, the writings of the Apostle Paul? Oh, how many of you are really, really glad that he decided to go with his heart instead of his head? Amen. Do you know how many times you're going to be faced this week with the question, do I go with my heart or do I go with my head? Mm -hmm. A lot of times. Not every moment, but a lot of times. This week, you have to decide. Yeah. Let's keep reading. Verse 15. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed and entered the house and after laying his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So we see that Ananias' heart ran out, but, or won out. But let me ask you this. Do you remember how the light from heaven interrupted Paul's theology? He, his, and his idea was that Jesus Christ was a, of Nazareth was a heretic. Yeah. He went from believing he was a heretic and a rebel to believing he was God. Yeah. Now, his theology is ready to be completely upended again. And you say, how is that? Look at verse 17 at the end. He says, the Lord Jesus has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Did you know he didn't even know if there was a Holy Spirit? That's right. Paul was caught at a moment when he was broken and desperate and hungry, he'd been fasting, and he received. Yeah. But Paul could have drawn a line on being used to God by saying, well, I believe in, the, in, in being saved. That makes sense, but no Holy Spirit. Come on. <laughs> this fun. It is. Yeah. <laughs> Look at verse 19. He took some food, was strengthened. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying he is the Son of God. Now here's a question for verse 20. Where did all this new information come from? Everybody say the heavenly realm. If you listen to the heavenly realm this week, you're going to do more than just know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You're going to walk in love toward people who do not deserve love. Yeah. You're going to hear bad news about people and not repeat it. You're going to live like the king of heaven walks with you. Oh, don't forget, I'm really going to quiet mine. Come on. Paul went from killing Christians to making Christians because he followed his heart. And he went from not knowing if there was a Holy Spirit to speaking in other tongues because he kept his heart open. 
When you're born again, it was by the supernatural revelation, as I said, of the conviction of the Holy Spirit. In that moment, you were heavenly minded, eternity minded, and you made good choices when you got born again. Now, as I said, to fulfill the overall, total, complete destiny God has given you, you will fulfill that destiny to the degree that you live out of your heart and keep your heart open to information from above. Paul later called darkness living only out of your mind. Will you go to Ephesians 4.17? This was supposed to be the text of the whole message, but I decided to put up. It would be hard to understand until we look at the other scriptures. We're almost done here. This, if you have one text for this week or one verse to meditate on, I hope it's this one. Ephesians 4.17. So this I say, and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. Now, why doesn't your computer know about God? Because your computer has no spirit to relate to God. It can't say, I love you, because it has no spirit, and it can't. Your head is a fine instrument. Your computer is a fine instrument, depending on what you've downloaded into it. But you're, if you live completely on the knowledge given to you from your head, you live in darkness. Yeah. And you say, how do you know this? Look at verse 17. It says, this I say, therefore, and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk. Now, who are the Gentiles? The Gentiles are the heathen that don't know God. Let's stop for a minute. How do the heathen walk? If you go out of here and say, I'm going to lead five people to the Lord today. Thank God. Awesome. Hallelujah. And you go out and you say, this is awesome news. You're on your way to hell and you can go to heaven. They'll hide their beer behind your back. So you get lost. And go on. Yeah. Why? Because they're walking in the futility of their mind. They're, they don't want to hear anything you have to say because they already know all there is to know. It's true. It's true. Now, Sometimes God brings Christians here into this church to be told about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh -oh. And they don't want to hear because they are, I don't know, we'll go there in a minute. <laughs> I'm really trying to help you. Did you know that? Yeah. You will fulfill the will of God for your life to the degree that you keep your heart open right. to light from heaven. Let me back up and read something I missed. Paul called, later called darkness, here in this verse, he called darkness living only in your own thoughts and reasonings. He called it the futility of your mind. It's the way he was on the road to Damascus. If you are living a joyless Christian existence, joyless, I'd like to suggest that the problem may be that you have slipped back into the darkness of your own thinking Amen. and unconsciously excluded yourself from the life of God. You see, I don't think anybody here deliberately turn from God, you wouldn't show up to church on a Sunday morning. But it's possible without realizing it to get back into the mental realm so exclusively that we're thinking, 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 thinking. And even if the Holy Spirit does have a word of advice, we're so much in the mental realm. Yeah. Yeah. Understanding and wisdom, if you look at verse 18, it says that the Gentiles are darkened in their understanding. You understand that if they could just Look into the spiritual realm and see heaven or hell. Most people are not stupid enough to scream in agony and hell by choice for eternity, right? It's because they're darkened in their understanding. The part I wanted you to see this, that understanding is of the spirit. If you go to the book of Proverbs, wisdom is always spoken of as being part of the heart, part spiritual, okay? Now, let me ask you these questions about the unsaved. Is the life of God available to them? Yeah. Yeah. Is, un, it, is its unavailability their problem? No, it's the darkness of their heart. It's the fact that they are living exclusively. They have a spirit. Yeah. And you say, how do you know? Because atheists call on God in foxholes. Yeah. There can be people that absolutely tell you, they're an atheist, I'm an atheist, and then their mom gets cancer, and they want us to pray for her. Come on. Yeah. Uh, I'm not making fun of them. It's just that their spirit knows good and well that there is a God. Okay, now here's the real question. Unbelievers are darkened in their understanding, and that's why they want the fertility of their mind. Could this apply to Christians, or is it a danger only available to unbelievers? Go back to verse 17. Who is Paul?
Paul talking to in the letter? To Christians at Ephesus. And he says, this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you don't balk in the futility of your mind. Sometimes, let's suppose it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Folks come in and they don't know about the baptism and you begin to teach them. And they say, oh, but I know. And they argue from a place in their head without even talking to you about the scriptures. Come on. It, come on. Here's the point. God wants us to come to a new level of love every, every week that we live. Amen. To a place where if we see a, a Christian doing wrong, we don't judge them, we don't repeat it, we pray for them. Where we make reconciliation, where we forgive, where we are instruments of reconciliation and healing. Every place we go, we're a blessing. Yes. He will call us upward every week that we live until we become like Jesus. Yes. But the moment we get into the darkness of our understanding, our heart, our heads are proud. It's like I showed you last week. The last argument you had. It's because you knew you were right. And your head is proud just like mine is. Pox, knowledge puffs up, it says in verse 2. Hey, but love and advice. In verse 17, he's talking to Christians. And he's saying, don't walk around with a massive head being ruled by prideful thinking. And almost positive, 100% positive that you know. If Christians... I'm just talking about you. It's a good thing. It's not. When Christians walk around in the middle ground ruled by their heads, we're quick to judge, criticize, talk bad about people, and slow to be compassionate and generous. Mm -hmm. The more you walk in your head, the more cynical you become and the harder it is. But you know what happens when you just decide, you know what? Okay, and you say, well, for, there's obviously this conflict. How many of times you've heard them take an offering for missions and you really wanted to give. And part of you super much wanted to give to God, and part of you super much didn't. Now, if you don't raise your hand, I'm going to pass the blind devil. How many of you have been there? Now, that is a real war going in, on inside of you, and it's between two parts of your being. Your body doesn't have too much to say about that one, but your heart says, oh, they need help. What a wonderful thing. And your head says, yes, but what in the world? How would, you know, the that bill may be very big, but okay. If you live in your heart, you hear from God. You tend to be generous. You believe God in your heart. Joy is in the spirit. Right. Otherwise, you grow more and more cynical. Okay, I've got to wrap this up. <laughs> Do you remember what Ananias told Saul? He said, the Lord has sent me to you to regain your sight and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Saul was in a time of brokenness and received. Acts 19. You got five more minutes here? I've got to wrap this up. If you're here for the first time, I never, never, I almost never, never go by 12, right? I don't I think I, I'll hurry up. So here's Paul a few years later. And he's ministering the same truth that was ministered to him. Acts 19, 1. It happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, oh, we don't even know there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. Now, what does that mean? John baptized, just preach repentance. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. So in this account, you've got 12 guys in a new church trying to follow God. They are sincere in their ignorance. They are gone as far as, John said, we hope the Lamb of God. John said, repent. They didn't even know Jesus died on the cross. They didn't know even resurrection. They got as far as John's baptism. That's all they knew. They were sincere in their ignorance. Do you know that all of us are sincere in our ignorance in some part of our lives? <laughs> Anyhow, the cool part is that their hearts were open. Paul says, hey, the Lord has sent me to bring you additional light. There is a Holy Spirit. At that point, they had a choice. Yeah. They could walk in the futility of their minds and say, well, nobody in Ephesus does anything like that. We haven't heard of anybody in Ephesus speaking in tongues. Right. Okay. right. Or they could stay open. Verse 5, immediately they got baptized in water. Didn't take them any big time to obey God. And in verse 6, they're praying in a new language. They live with a heart open to God. I believe that the single greatest challenge in the life of a Christian, you want to be, you want to be victorious, is yeah. to keep your heart open to what the Holy Spirit's telling you moment by moment. And if you do, if you do that, you'll find yourself giving to people you had no idea, no intention of giving to. Oh, see, God, you just got my head. Now, why, why are we afraid 
to become generous heart. Because we're afraid God will make a fool out of us. Uh -huh. But you know what? That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the generous man will be watered. Yeah. The one who scatters is going to reap. Yeah. I'm... Yeah. Could you go to Acts 18? We're, we're, you're right there, and then this, I think this is the last scripture. Another man named Apollos. And this somehow close they are together here. Acts 18, 24. Now a Jew named, Apo a Jew named Apollos and an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in scriptures. Now is this a good guy? Yeah, he's mighty in scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in spirit, and he was teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. Now he's just like the other guy, he's sincere in his ignorance. He knew as far as John. He began to speak out boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and her, Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him more accurately the way of, of the Lord. Let's stop. Verse 25. Was this guy 100% sincere? It said he was teaching accurately everything he did, right? Yeah. Verse 26. Was Priscilla and Aquila's intention to embarrass him? No. no. They just wanted him to be able to be used far, further by the Father, okay? Could he have said, excuse me, but I am far more eloquent than you are? He was more eloquent than Paul. Paul said so in his letters. Yeah. Do you know what happens when you're good at something? Your head says, you're better than them. Why do you listen to them? Uh -oh. huh? You know? Mm -hmm. This is what's beautiful about Apollos. Look at verse 27. After they corrected him in 26, when he wanted to go across to Achaia, the brethren encouraged him. They wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he had arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. Isn't that something? For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. He became a greater blessing, a greater help, because even though he was a powerful orator, he stayed teachable. God will lead you as long as you walk in the spirit out of your heart and you stay tender and teachable. Okay, now I don't know if you got anything out of this sermon or not. But what the enemy wants is for you to think, think, think. He wants it to be more important. What new flavor of... What does what 7-Eleven have? I thought of it this morning. Slurpee, I don't get it. Okay. <laughs> Slurpee. I know people who can tell you every flavor of... Slurpee, the 7-Eleven has, what the flavor of the month is, and what's going to be next month. That's all right. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you can't tell me five verses of Scripture, you're carly minded. I love Starbucks. I try to stay away from Starbucks. Starbucks is not good for the wallet. Or the <laughs> I put it, I never can remember what is my favorite. I said, you know, what is it that I like here? You know what? Okay, they say, duh, Pastor, duh. Okay, I agree. But I want to tell you something. I'd rather know Ephesians. I'd rather be able to take you to the place that delineates and explains my salvation. And I'd rather have the, the clear hearing from the Holy Spirit than to spend all of my time on carnal things that won't matter a whip in 50 years. And God is ready. You say, why in the world would you call a church to prayer? Because there's a scripture in Psalm 42, I think it's verse 7, Don. It says, deep calls to deep. When something deep inside of you calls to the deep part of God, He answers. Yes. And when you say, Raspberry is my favorite Slurpee, what's your favorite Slurpee? Let's get on Facebook and talk. I'm just kidding. Oh. <laughs> I don't have a Facebook page. Once in a while, I read Facebook with my kids. Like, they listen. I, am I being rough on you? No. Oh, <laughs> I want you to know three things. You are a spirit. You have yes. a wonderful mind. A mind that is beyond what, you know, who, who could have thought of it. But your mind has information from this realm only if you don't get in the Word of God and pray in the Spirit. Yeah. And we are living in an age when it is vital for your success to get uh, information from the other realm. That's true. If you watch, I mean, just watch that one chapter. Paul's going along sincerely killing Christians. And information comes from heaven and says, you're killing the wrong dudes. Yeah. Let's start making some. 
So he starts making Christians instead of killing them. That's information from above. And Ananias is having a very good day, afraid of Tarsus, Tarsus, who he's heard has warrants in Damascus. And God speaks to Ananias and says, guess what? You get to go pray for his healing. He's going to get, receive his sight and start praying another time and be filled with the Spirit. He says, no way. I got a wife and kids. Who's going to pray for my wife and kids? We don't have social security yet. <laughs> this is true. Did you know I've never had God speak to me anything but what my head explained why not? Come on. Everything I've ever done was with my head screaming. Yeah. When I said, okay, I'll pastor the church. And God had told me, God gave me plenty of information in the spirit of what was going to happen if I had been. My head screamed and screamed and screamed. You know what they say about women preaching? And my head for three years screamed and screamed and screamed. And finally we were having too much time or fun and I just laughed at it. <laughs> Do you understand? You have to ignore. When I got filled with the Holy Ghost, like I said, I was I, had, I was summa cum laude. My dad was a university president at another university. I was so proud of my intellect. Mathematics major. But would you like to discuss in world topics? I'll take you on. I, I was proud of my intellect. And I was so desperate, so desperate. Then I said, God, I don't know if my grandma's telling me the truth about this baptism of the Holy Spirit. I didn't even get the Bible out and check it out. I never read the Bible. Thought I knew all the Bible said. Anyhow, I said, if it's real, please fill me. And I began praying in a new language, and my head screamed, you're smart. I'm in charge. What are you doing? And my heart says, oh, this is wonderful. I found Jesus. And my head says, this can't possibly be a language. And the next day, day I got up, and they said, you you're out in the woods praying in other tongues because nobody in your university, it's a Christian university, didn't believe in getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. Why don't you just speak in Babel? But you know what I began to see? I began to see answers in my life. I began to see power in my life. I began to see fear fall. And I began to see the power of Almighty God that was proud. But you, I had to come against my head every step of the way. After 30 years of living by faith, by finances, God had to deal with me over Christmas. He says, you've lost your hilarious giving spirit. And I started giving back, and it started coming back and working again. But you know that I had to fight my head at the end of December when God said, get back on to the hilarious giving where you were. And when I did it, but my head was, I have inside information. You better talk to me and nothing about this. What would Bill Gates say? <laughs> you know, you're smarter than this. All week this week, God will say, ah, just let it slide. You don't have to make a big issue about that. And your head will say, well, you need to just tell because you know what they said about you. <laughs> and you have to override your mind. Yeah. Your mind's selfish. Yeah. Your mind is right. small thinking. Yeah. Live big hearted. Oh, yeah. Live believing God. <laughs> And he said, I don't know if I know how to live out of my spirit. Then spend time every day feeding your spirit yeah. and saying, God, I want to be aware of you. Just like Nathan prayed. He says, you know, when two people love each other, they never lose the awareness. I got a good music team get up there. I'm sorry. God wants you aware of your spirit and open to information from your spirit. Does that much make sense? You've got to choose. Feed your spirit.